What's up guys? So I wanted to quickly preface this video because this is definitely going to be different content than what you're normally used to seeing here on Learning the Lines, but I think you guys are really going to like it. So what is this video going to be exactly? Well, it's actually going to be an hour-long film about sailing from the 1980s, and more specifically sailing the Corsair F-27 in the 1989 Newport to Ensenada race. So this was a film created by Corsair Marine back in the 80s to promote the F-27. As you guys might already know, I'm currently refitting a Corsair F-27, so I was certainly interested in watching this video. I thought it was awesome. I actually liked it so much that I asked permission from Corsair Marine to go ahead and edit the video a little bit, just make it a little bit better, and then to go ahead and post it on Learning the Line so that you guys can see the video as well and enjoy it as I did. This movie is definitely a blast from the past, and I think it's really entertaining. It shows you what was happening in the sailing world back in 1989, and I think it's really cool. It's also not filmed, obviously, in the best quality. It's only in 240p, but I do think it's watchable and I think it's enjoyable. And I think for anybody that's interested in trimarans or, you know, just sailing in general, it's definitely a very informative and entertaining video. So I think y'all are going to like it. Also, when I purchased the trimaran, some of you guys didn't really understand why. You didn't really understand, you know, what the benefits of a trimaran are. I think this video is actually going to be pretty good for those of you that don't necessarily understand Corsair trimarans or really, you know, trailerable trimarans in general. This movie is definitely really good at showing you the advantages to these types of boats. And if you don't quite understand these boats yet, I definitely recommend you guys watch this video. Also, John Walton of Walmart is actually in this video as well. He's in the race sailing his own personal Corsair F-27. I thought that's pretty cool. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoy this one. And without further ado, here is the movie. At the end of a successful weekend cruise to Catalina Island last fall, a group of owners of F-27 trimarans decided to organize a more substantial cruise for the following year. They would, they decided, race their boats in the world's largest yacht race to Ensenada, Mexico. Then trailer their boats 350 miles south to the cruising grounds of the Midriff Islands in the Sea of Cortez, where they would spend a week of fishing, diving, and exploring. This is the story of their expedition. In preparation, and to get their adrenaline going, a group of them first took their boats up to windy San Francisco Bay. Such is trailer sailing. A trip that would be a major mission by water becomes just another drive up the freeway. Another opportunity to go sailing. If you've never sailed at the speed of the wind, well, hang on to your hat. Even with full sail in a strong blow, the F-27 never heals beyond 15 degrees. And if you want to flatten it even further, it's a simple task with the roller reefing main. Who says reefing slows you down? Who says trimarans can't go to windward? Watch out as the F-27 punches forward into the wind and chop at 10 knots. Think we can catch that 35-footer? Mmm, toast. The tiller can be a one-finger exercise, even at speeds approaching 20 knots. The broad beam of the trimaran makes a spinnaker pull almost redundant, and without one, jibing becomes an effortless operation. San Francisco was just the hors d'oeuvre. The race and cruise to Mexico took a little more planning and preparation. Down, Billy. Bells, which will be, you know, essential could be, and uh, upper and lower radiator hoses. Sunday we leave at noon, mm -hmm. one o'clock, 
take about a four hour deal down here, get here in the, in the evening. We're still in the ocean breeze. How do we get the boats to Newport? How do we get the trailers to Ensenada? Where's the ramp? What about the drinking water? What about the gas? What about our friends? Can they come too? Well, only, it would appear, if they have an F-27 too. For what other boat can lead the pack of 500 down the coast to Ensenada, then be packed on a trailer and easily taken over land to the fabulous cruising grounds of the Sea of Cortez? It's a perpetual complaint about this most popular of races. There is sunshine and wind at your back for the race itself. But once it's over, it's a long uphill slog to get the boat home. That is, unless you have your trailer waiting in Ensenada and plan to spend the next week instead cruising the warm waters further south. In a part of the world where tradition means something's been around since last Wednesday, there is some real tradition to the Newport Ensenada race. This was the 42nd running of the event, which has been sailed every April since 1948 and seen well over 15,000 sailors enter the 125-mile run to Mexico. The race attracts old traditional schooners like Kelpie, which has been in every race for the past 20 years. Ultralight classics like Ragtime, IOR winners like Trevisio, and retired 12 meters such as Newsboy. Jerry Concert, the official photographer of the race and a fixture in her tiny aluminum skiff and one-woman airplane at the start and finish lines, has almost an embarrassment of nautical riches to record. Since the mid-50s, the race has welcomed multi-hulls as well as unimorans. Over the years, it has attracted most of the hottest West Coast cats and tries, including Rudy Choi's many Honolulu-based cats named Iconi, Imi Loa, which has sailed in every Ensenada race for the past 27 years, the F-27 Super Fox, of which more later, Wind Warrior, and Double Bullet, which currently holds the record. This year, the race will also see the entry of the world's best-known convert to multi-hulls in the controversial America's Cup defender, Stars and Stripes, which will be trying to break that record. But its skipper is no newcomer to the race. race. Probably more than any other race I've ever been in. I'd say probably started in about... It's an admission of guilt to tell you how long ago, but... If it's older than me, we're in trouble. I would say that it was at least 30 years ago. How old are you? 32. <laughs> probably before Gino was born. And I had the good fortune of going with a guy by the name of Ash Bound on a boat that called Carousel. It was one of my mentors and Owens Cutter back in the old late 50s, middle 50s. And he always knew where to go, and so we always did real well in the race. San Diego always kind of had this big rivalry with Newport to see if he win the most trophies. This was, this was, at this time, the Ensenada race was the big race of the year. It was like the major race that everybody wanted to go in. So we used to look forward to that for a long time. Stars and Stripes, possibly the fastest sailboat in the world, is a no-holds-barred day racer, which has had some tiny berths, anchors, and outboards, specially added to allow it to pass inspection for this open ocean race. The F-27s it will be racing against, on the other hand, are sport cruisers, designed for family sailing and cruising, for strength and seaworthiness, and fun and comfort, as much as for speed. They're equipped with two cabins, a warm, finished interior, five berths, and a galley and have been extensively cruised around the Bahamas, Europe, and America. Every year, the Newport Nautical Museum honors past winners and entrants in the Ensenada event. This year, the museum saluted the fraternity that has dominated first to finish honors in the race, multi-hullers. In addition to these gentlemen, we're, we're pleased to have with us tonight another gentleman who's done a, several Ensenada races, and has done it with Rudy, and then Rudy's design boats, and that's the gentleman you all know, Buddy Anson. Buddy? As we all know, there are only three kinds of boats. There's a cat, a half cat, and a cat and a half. <laughs> I want to say that I'm very, uh, very happy to be here to greet uh, friends. I want to say old friends, friends that I've known a long time. And uh, starting at the end of the line there, uh, Bob has invited me to sail on his boat. I uh, never uh, I had the opportunity, really. And, uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. I'll send my uh, chauffeur over to take up my... <laughs>
sail around the Cape, uh, Cape Horn. He was looking uh, for sponsors. I said, why don't you try Forest Lawn? <laughs> In the last few years, the number of multi-hall entrants in the race had been declining, largely the result of the difficulty of financing one-of-a-kind multi-halls. But unlike custom or home-built boats, which are often built to wildly different standards, the F-27 is known for its strong materials and uniform and tough construction techniques. have been proven with years of offshore use, including passages across both the Pacific and the Atlantic. This year, of 28 multi-hull starters in the Ensenada event, 10 will be F-27s, and one of them will win the race. Amongst the F-27 skippers, Bill Schultz in Try to Fly. Bill has been racing multi-hulls for years and has been sailing the Ensenada race since 1962. Mike Mitchie, customer service rep for Corsair Marine sailing the prototype F-27 Super Fox. Jerry Grant, a film composer from Hollywood, California, and in fact, composer of the music in this video. Racing third movement, Jerry has recently racked up an impressive string of victories. David Niebergall, a Malibu dentist who has sailed a great variety of multi-hull boats and will race in his Tridactyl in his third Ensenada event. John Simpkins, a building contractor from Dana Point, California, who has tricked out flying fish with all new sails and rigging for the race. Don Mitz, a California Highway Patrol officer with an appropriately named boat. And John Walton, president of Corsair Marine, considered by everyone in the fleet to be the hot F-27 sailor and the man to beat. As a purebred racer, I find the multi-hull to be the most exciting racing I've ever done. Everyone seems to be moving to multi-hulls. Tom Blackler came down to talk sailing to a forum in Newport preceding the race and ended up talking multi-hulls. It's good competition and good sailing. It's not for everybody. Uh, I mean, it's, the, the boats aren't comfortable, uh, but they are relatively inexpensive and they're very, very fast. I, for one, think that the pro level is best served at, with those particular boats. I thought that, that uh, you know, my own opinion was that, and I, I think the America's Cup ought to be held in 100-foot-long catamarans, but... Yeah. Nobody's going to listen to me about that. Following the event, we asked Tom if after sailing multi-hulls for the past year, he can ever go back to sailing unimorans. Um, when I, I first set foot on the multi-hull in October of 1988. That's, I mean, I had been on a multi-hull. Let's say I'd sailed a Hobie 14 with my wife off Waikiki Beach, you know. But I hadn't done anything really um, serious in multi-hulls. And when I first got on the, the P-40 Cat in San Francisco Bay and... October, we towed her out of Sausalito and uh, was blown about 25 knots, and we put the sails up. We took off across the bay at what must have been 25 or 30 knots of boat speed, and my, my first impression was, my God, where have I been all my life? What have I been doing? The three days before the Ensenada event are filled with seminars, parties, and yacht club open houses. But for many, getting ready for Ensenada began with the race seminars, held up and down the coast over the preceding month. If you thought sailboat racing meant pulling the sails up and cracking open a beer, well, you better listen to this. Uh, they will broadcast a number to you that will be in the low 1,000s, like 1,007, 1,012, 1,005, numbers like that. If you take the LAX number and subtract from it the Daggett number, you'll get the pressure differential, and that's the key. We're looking for what is the difference between those two differentials. If you have a less extreme weather front, like three or four millibars coming through, uh, the wind's probably going to go blow better outside the rum line than on the rum line, and, and that's where I think it really pays off to go reaching out, try to optimize your sailing angles. Now, all of that is, is a lot of mumbo-jumbo, and that's hard to absorb. So some people don't even bother trying. They're in the race strictly to have a good time. The only prize they could possibly win is the one given for the last boat to Ensenada. In fact, to some, the race is best known for those who take it least seriously. 
best known of whom are the San Francisco group that call themselves the Prospectors. But this is in keeping with my good friend Hank Harris, who's standing behind the cameras, setting up of an idea in San Francisco about 14 years ago, where we were having a little luncheon from the Transpac crew that uh, raced the boat, raced, raced to uh, Hawaii. And we had a great time, so we decided to have a reunion. We had this little dinner at Tadish's, and after a couple of bottles of Ramey Martin, Hank and I were talking, and we said, we ought to do something together each year. And so we thought it should be sailing oriented, and uh, we asked around, and Tom Hannon, our skipper at the time, and the first starting skipper said, and owner of Prospector, where the Prospectors come from, said, you know, this is this race in Southern California down there. And I said, well, that's warm, and everybody said, that's nice, and Hague went to some little known university down here in Southern California, and so, so it'd be a good idea. I said, how many boats in this race? He says, oh, three, four hundred. I said, hell, they'll never know we were there. Let's do it in costume. And Hank says, no, no. Let's do it in tuxedos. Fourteen years ago, we show up down here. Black tie, first time. White tie, since then. With a topless waitress pouring our champagne and music and entertaining the folks in Southern California. And we've been somewhat known for that since. The prospectors have a unique philosophy on sailing. They dress to the nines, at least from the waist up, use distraction rather than boat speed as the basic technique of racing, pink elephants and string quartets on the foredeck, racy films on the sails at night, attract attention wherever they go, and invite all manner of guests along, some dressed in formal attire, others less formally. We haven't turned anyone down yet, and as middle age crisis creeps up on us, I doubt if we're going to turn anybody down. Whether your concern is having fun or going fast, by the Thursday before the event, everyone is in full gear preparing for the race. For the yacht chandleries of Newport, it's the busiest day of the year. In Ensenada, the Ponga drivers and trinket salesmen are preparing for the onslaught. On the Yacht Club docks, the last of the boats are being inspected by the race committee. Oh, all right. I got my slope right here. Oh, good. Okay, we're up on deck. Uh, you got your man overboard stuff and everything yes, here? Yeah. You're going to make an attachment between? Yeah, light attachment. Yeah. And your strobe, I assume, is down below? Okay. Come down and take a look at that. One thing we do need to correct is make sure all the strobes and everything are attached before the race. Right. And, um... Uh, that is over there with the radar reflector, I see it, okay? Right. Uh, flares. Uh, flares are forward. Okay. Flare. Owens. Okay. Oh, you got the good kit. All right. All right. Dates are current. Unlike the rest of the 550-boat fleet that has to slowly make their way to Newport on the water, the F-27s tool up the I-5 on the morning of the race, rig their boats, and pop them in the water. By Friday morning, Newport is filled to overflowing with the entrance and spectators. By 10.30, everyone, from ancient mariners to multi-hulls, 
boats racing under IMS, IOR, PHRF, and ORCA, from slugs to this year's center of attention, stars and stripes, everyone is headed for the water. Five hundred and fifty boats in a half square mile area, all headed in totally different directions, is a sight that will give even experienced racers pause. Believe me, if you haven't been there before, it's the most confusing mess on all of this earth. When you're going up to the start line, it's a real zoo. You can't see the committee boats. You'll be doing well to be able to see your land fix points behind you and take a couple of bearings and say, okay, I think we're in the right area for our start. Somehow, in the mass of racers, spectators, distractions, helicopters, and unofficial entrance, the boats do get lined up and start the race. On the windward end, John Walton in Corsair and Dennis Connor in Stars and Stripes sail across the line together. It's obvious which of the boats was getting the attention of the powerboat fraternity. In many ways, the F-27 is ideal for a race like this. Not only is it easy to get to and from the race, but it performs very well both to windward and off the wind, and very well in light airs, as well as when it starts to pipe up. The boat was designed by Ian Ferrier in 1985. Uh, what we tried to achieve with the F-27 was a boat that combined all the advantages of the multi-hull, such as wide beam, the stability, the unsinkability, the excellent handling, with the practical aspects of the conventional boat, such as the monohull, primarily simple marina docking. And uh, with, along with some easy marina docking, you get easy trailability. And uh, there's an even bigger advantage in that you, don't, you can put the boat on the trailer, you can trail it anywhere across the country, greatly increasing your cruising range. Uh, you can save on the dock fees, you don't have to put in the dock. The boat, even though it's a big boat, it's capable of crossing oceans, it's across the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean. It is light because of our modern construction techniques. There's a light, easy to tow boat and easy to handle boat. So we feel we've come up with what is probably the ideal cruiser. It's light, it's very fast, it's easy to handle, and uh, you can put it away when you're finished with it. Ian makes it sound simple but it was a highly complicated design challenge to create a boat that would both fold and trailer, be strong and seaworthy, yet light and fast. Ian designed the boat on a computer and also used it to ensure that it's built as it was designed. Can you show us some of your trade secrets? Yeah, sure. This is a Macintosh 2 computer, and on this we virtually designed the whole boat and the, the construction systems of the boat. Starting in the lamination shop where we laminate all the various parts. Every part is laminated according to a schedule such as this one here, which shows the part exactly what goes into it, what layers of cloth or biaxial fabric, and what uh, different reinforcements have to go in. This actually prints out in full color on a color printer that we have here, and it uh, goes into a book out on the shop floor. And every different lamination, such as you see here, which is actually unidirectional S glass is shown in blue, or if it's an e-glass, it's shown in red. And this means that every single phase of the boat is shown by this computer-generated sheet, eliminating any possibility of error, and the, the guy on the shop floor 
has an exact guide of what he should be doing on every boat. And you have a step-by-step -step instructions down here, which show each stage as they should be doing it. It's not difficult to make strong fiberglass boats, just keep slopping the resin into the mold. And that's exactly what many boat builders do, creating boats that are many times heavier and thus much slower than they were designed to be. It takes time to use the techniques invented in the aerospace industry to keep the boat strong but keep weight to a minimum. But the people who build the F-27 also sail the F-27, and they want to go fast. Hence, multi-strata vacuum pressure, the technique which Corsair is alone among production boat builders in using. A technique which not only bonds the core and fiberglass skins together for maximum strength, but also removes all excess weight from the laminate. And reduced weight, as the rest of the Ensenada fleet is seeing, to their dismay, means the boats go faster. By now, the fleet is starting to spread out. The shortest distance between Newport and Ensenada, the rum line, is not necessarily the best route to take. Some navigators will reach out to sea, hoping to pick up in speed what they will have to make up in distance. Others will go inshore, hoping in part to pick up an offshore breeze come nightfall. The only obstacle on the course are the Coronado Islands, lying five miles offshore just south of San Diego. A week at the level ridge continues along the west coast with mostly fair weather for Southern California through the weekend. This afternoon, the weather has provided the usual light onshore flow. The F-27s and the Mega Dollar 70 Raiders, both good in light airs, have left most of the fleet behind. Of course, they're not quite in front. Connor's Stars and Stripes, perhaps the fastest multi-hull in the world, is up on one hull and heading down the coast towards her home port of San Diego. By now, the afternoon breeze has clocked north, and the boats are able to set their spinnakers. Mike Mitchie, skippering the original F-27, Super Fox, is the first to raise his chute. flying successfully, the others quickly follow suit. With their chutes up, the F-27s pick up speed, moving now at 10 knots in the light afternoon breeze. Around them, the fleet spreads out. A patriotic schooner flies a flag as big as some boat's jibs. Lady Godiva stretches to catch all the wind with a crazy patchwork quilt of Kevlar. Aboard the Swan 57, Ms. Blue, East Coast sailor Walter Cronkite gets a taste of California sailing. The wind holds through the afternoon, and the F-27s speed down the coast. But with the setting sun, the wind begins to die, and off La Jolla, it looks improbable that stars and stripes can break the record. Aboard Super Fox, we settled in for a night on the ocean. Early Saturday morning, stars and stripes ghosted across the Ensenada finish line. The wind just continues to get lighter and lighter during the early evening, and uh, as you can see here now, it's basically glassed off. It took us seven hours to go the last 10 miles, so the, that's sailboat racing. But uh, I think we'll probably do all right uh, on corrected time, because it's going to be hard for me, uh, the other boats to go very far in this uh, relatively calm situation. Do you think you still win the race? Well, I'm not sure. We'd like to think so, but uh, have to wait for morning and see if there's anybody else around. Many people say that light air is the real test of sailors and boats, 
If that's so, the F-27s passed with flying colors in the light conditions that night. Although there was hardly enough breeze to blow a match out, the boats kept their steady pace south toward Mexico. As we passed Chula Vista, the last town on the U.S. coast, and home of Corsair Marine, we again toasted the guys in the factory who had built the boat light, strong, and fast. The PVC core used in the F-27 helps give the boat its high strength to weight ratio, enhancing all-round performance. By 10 Saturday morning, the wind has begun to fill in, and the boats again begin to pick up speed. In this light air, a delicate hand on the tiller and a close eye on the spinnaker is the way to win the race. By now, most of the fleet has entered Mexican waters. This year, it was a mistake to go outside, and those who did are still back with the fishing boats off the Coronado Islands. Inside, the leaders, John Walton in Corsair and Mike Mitchie in Superfox, are off Rosarita Beach, fighting the temptation to turn in toward Ensenada too early. At one in the afternoon, Corsair is the first of the F-27s to cross the finish line. Meanwhile, friends, wives, and traveling companions are driving south to Ensenada with vans, trailers, and cruising supplies. Whether they've come by water or land, it's definitely another country. After the $200 designer sunglass shops, the Ferrari dealerships, and the half-million-dollar starter homes of Newport, it's a fair culture shock crossing south of the border. has turned several Ensenada establishments into institutions, most notably Husong's Cantina, an unprepossessing little bar which has now become a major retail chain and brewery. Dos cervezas, por favor. The fleet fills up the harbor, or in Spanish, the Ensenada of Ensenada. Aboard Cronkite's Ms. Blue, there's no doubt who the anchor man should be. But after a brief stay in the grimy waters of Ensenada Harbor, the F-27s, which with their boards up draw so little water they can go almost anywhere, head four miles south to surf into a shallow, protected, and quiet bay. If you like gunk holing and beach combing, the F-27 is the perfect boat. And if you do run aground, there's no need for trauma. Pull your centerboard up and you're on your way. this year is out of the first 13 boats in Orca on corrected time, F-27 took seven places. Oh, out of right. first the next day, it's time for the prizes. First, the F-27 fleet trophies, which John Walton presents in the courtyard of an Ensenada hotel. There's one, one thing that I think we all ought to be real proud of as a class was the uh, fact that, you know, Stars and Stripes was in the race, the America's Cup catamaran, and at the finish, we had four F-27s try to fly, uh, third movement, Corsair and Super Fox that corrected out in front of Stars and Stripes. So congratulations to all you guys. So that was really a great showing. Every year, the Corsair factory puts up trophies for the top privately owned F-27s in the race. Place, try to fly, Bill Schultz. <laughs> First 
place. Of course, is our perennial uh, hot sailor. Uh, fleet, uh, fleet threat is uh, Jerry Grant on uh, third movement. Of course, is to beat John, <laughs> and, uh, and that's what keeps us going around the course. To collect John's prizes, we move on to race headquarters at the Bahia, where the official results are announced and the trophies presented. The mood is boisterous as Uncle Walter and the NOSA officials hand out the silverware. Walter, who is here to write a book on West Coast sailing, gets an idea of how Californians accept sailing trophies. Corsair is the first production multi-hull ever to win both the trophies for first trimaran and first place multi-hull. The next morning, it's time to hit the road for Bahia de Los Angeles. As well as the major reason, which is to keep the boats light so they'll go fast on the water, the other reason Corsair goes to such lengths to vacuum all excess weight from the boats is so they can be easily towed by standard-sized cars and vans. Even with a strong steel trailer, the towing package weighs under 4,000 pounds, so it can be towed by a standard-sized car or a minivan. about the F-27, I, I told Carol, I said, this might be the boat for us. We were then considering a Newport 30 Mark III for, with, with a lot of cruising accommodations, but I wanted something faster, so I really had my eye on a Hobie 33. I like the idea of trailering a boat, not paying all those uh, heavy uh, slip fees every month. We went down to the Long Beach show, and uh, Mike Nietzsche took us out on the whole, on the F-27 in the Long Beach Marina. Carol and I just fell in love with it. It was everything we wanted it to be. It was big enough inside to cruise. We could put it on a trailer, and it really goes fast. That's what I like. The crew and I were doing four, or 15 solid for two hours, and it was just fantastic. I mean, we were just flying by these 40-footers that started an hour earlier and uh, we didn't break anything. We got soaking wet, but we came home and uh, washed her up and she's just as good as new. And that's really, that's really a great feeling. Um, and I did write to Ian and John and, and thank them for, for the great design because I really think the boat is, uh, is every, it's everything we've ever wanted in a boat. Dynamite. I think it's uh, probably one of the safest sailboats out there. It certainly is one of the quickest. And the thing I like the most about it is the, the transportability of it, where you can bring the unit basically anywhere you want. Still, towing a boat on the roads of Baja, you can't speed. 
So what with the awards and the filming and the pit stops, by the time John and Christy arrive in the village, the other boats are all rigged and in the water. We decide it's time to put a stopwatch on John and see how quickly he can put the boat together. While Christy and two-year-old son Lucas head to town to get ice for the cruise, John goes to work. There are two tie-downs you've got to remove, then detach the trailer lights. We normally attach the two tie-downs together and use them as a launching bow line. The trailer winch strap is disconnected from the boat, then put up on the deck, as we're going to use it in a minute to pull up the mast. Disconnect all the mast rope ties and Velcro rigging straps. Then push the mast on its stern roller aft and insert the legs in the pivot brackets. Pull out the rest of the trailer winch strap and connect it to the jib halyard. Check that the other end of the halyard is tied to the mast cleat, then step down. The Amas both have non-skid on them to make this easy and start winching the mast up. The lower and intermediate shrouds will prevent sideways movement and hold the mast steady on the way up, so it's an easy one-man operation. Once the mast is up, connect the fore stay, remove the raising bar, and connect the baby stay. These are all done with clevis pins, so there's no need to adjust any turnbuckles or to touch the shrouds at all. Now, attach the topping lift. Insert the shaft of the roller furling boom through the mast and connect the handle. Attach the main sheath and thread the color-coded halyards through the cheek blocks to the rope clutches on the cabin roof. And that's about it. It's time to get her wet. Note that we've reconnected the winch hook to the boat. Other than that, there's no need for straps for this short journey. Absolutely the most important thing to do before launching, even in a remote village like Bahia de Los Angeles, is to check overhead for wires or obstructions before driving to the ramp. You can easily still step onto the boat without getting your feet wet, and now it's just a case of lowering the rudder from the cockpit, starting the engine, and pushing off. The boat is very stable and can easily be motored about the anchorage with the amas in the folded position. locking pin. Place your foot on the top of the folding strut and pull down on the beam. It doesn't take any great strength, the float just pulls down on its own. 
The wing nets are permanently attached and just stretch into place. There's a bolt for each Akka, and the top shrouds have to be pinned to the floats. Well, we're ready to go. And it took John under 20 minutes to put it together. No doubt it'll take you a little longer than that the first time you try it. But with a little practice, one person can easily do it in half an hour. And in Bahia de Los Angeles, it took Christy and Lucas that long to find the ice house. But they found it. So we're rigged and stocked and ready to go exploring. Earlier that morning, the rest of the fleet had gone ahead and is now anchored in a remote cove on the uninhabited and beautiful Partida Island. That evening, after a great sail across the bay, we catch up with them in the well-protected anchorage. system makes stowing the mainsail an easy task after a day on the water. The Bahia de Los Angeles is a delightful cruising area filled with uninhabited islands, good anchorages, great fishing, and an abundance of wildlife. The seas are flat and the wind usually builds to 10 to 15 every afternoon. Baja cruising is an easy to take blend of medium air sailing with beachcombing, fishing, diving, and generally just mucking around in boats. Sailing in flotilla adds community to the cruising lifestyle. On our second day there, for instance, David Niebergall's daughter Jennifer celebrated her fourth birthday in memorable fashion in the Sea of Cortez. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear JJ. Happy birthday to you. Another major advantage to the F-27 is that, unlike conventional boats in which you have to accurately spit your watermelon seeds over the side, on the F-27 you can just let them pop from your mouth through the holes in the netting into the water. There were no clowns at the party, but later that afternoon we did have some lions. Sea lions. It drops down real quick.
The F-27 makes an ideal dive boat, easy to get in and out of with the float-mounted boarding ladder and with lots of storage space for gear in the Amas. After we dragged him away from playing with the sea lions, we asked David Niebergall to compare this boat to his previous one. It was great at first. I thought I was going to go everywhere, but I found out that when you have a boat in the marina, in a slip, you can only sail from that place. And after a little while, you get bored with sailing that area. And the F-27 has opened up all these new areas. I hardly ever take it out of the same place twice in a row. Always go someplace new. Women are just as enthusiastic about the family purchase. Here's Carolyn Stans. And it's trailerable, and we wanted to go to Baja, so it seemed a boat for us. We keep it in the water, which is really handy. First time we've tailored it, no problem, and we like the aft cabin particularly because the boys can be down below when we're sailing. The aft cabin on the F-27 is great for kids or big enough for two friendly adults. The main salon sleeps two more on single berths, and there's another spacious single, along with a head, in the forepeak. There's a folding table, champagne's not included, and a galley with a 15-gallon water tank and a two-burner stove. Above the galley navigation area by the companionway, the pop top raises to give standing headroom. Many people sail the boat with the pop top up, weatherproofing it with a windowed canvas cover. You come outside, you stretch your legs, you move around, you can actually walk and use every part of the boat. It's real dry, and it feels like about two times, three times bigger than that Benetton. I know that sounds like a real exaggeration, but I don't care how wide it is. When you take it, when you take a boat and lean it up like a helix, you don't have any place to be. That's the bottom line. It's strong, so you could anchor in 60 knots of wind, which happens here quite occasionally, and, and still not worry about it. So. Just an ideal boat. We've had it now for about three months, and we keep liking it better and better every time. Just about. Yeah. Bill, did you think it was a bit pricey when you first got it, or what do you think of the, of the value that you get? Yeah, when well, we first went down to look, you know, and you just walk in and you expect like a Unimaran price, you know, a monohull. And I thought maybe 25000 you know, I'll go twenty-five. And then when we got the numbers that we're going to be chasing like 50 or 60 with it tricked out, it seemed a little out of hand until you look at it and see the quality construction, the, uh, just everything that goes into it, the perfection. And then when it's pointed out to you that if you will just pay the manufacturer slip fees, they'll give you the boat for free. Because it so happens to work out, that's just about the same. Because we just keep it at home and don't have slip fees. I also had a 27-foot... Uh, Monohull before this, uh, Morningstar glass over wood, uh, home built. And after having that for five, six years in Southern California, I just said that I wouldn't have another boat in Southern California, because there's nowhere to go. You sail out of the uh, bay, and that's the end of it. Uh, you know, a couple islands, and that's real, plus it's cold. But this thing, you know, we're down here. And we're gonna go up to the Delta. And, uh, in December, January, February, my fiance are going to the Bahamas with it. It just has everything. It's like a Huckleberry Finn raft that's fast. That's what I love about this boat. It's so fast. It just, it just goes. And the only time you really motor is, is in and out of a harbor. You don't even really need to do that. The ghosting speed on this, and just the fluff of a breeze, just a light little drift. The speed on this, the whole speed on this is as fast as my monohull went. 25, 35 knots of wind, because it just hits a certain point and stops. Plus, uh, I think the biggest, one of the biggest things for me is the ability to walk around. You're not confined to a cockpit or going down the center of the, the hall hanging on to everything. You can take a little cruise around this thing. You can lay down in the net, you can really relax, and they're dry. They're real dry, at least in most of the weather we've seen. How's the factory been to deal with that? you bought the boat? Oh, those guys are tough. You can't get anything out of those. Where are they? Matter of fact, John, what about those free things? No. The, the, the John has just been phenomenal. He always answers your call. He always takes time. 
He always explains it real clear, real uh, simple. He helps with everything. One of them, they're extremely helpful. Every time we go over there, uh, it's it's fun. You know, we just go go to visit the factory to talk to them. We have a very close relationship with our owners. We have uh, the F27 Owners Association has just been formed. Uh, we we actively race our boats and class fleets with our owners. We are we are on close term with terms of all of our owners and we believe in having a very close contact one to find out how their boats are going we have a policy of ringing every owner at the moment every year at least once a year to see how their boats are going uh, we get a lot of feedback from our owners uh, and, and ideas of improvements any problems they may have and uh, we can solve those problems for them or we can change the current boat so we eliminate any possibility of that problem happening again we really believe in having close contact with our owners. It's, it's, it's good both for them and for us. It helps the class grow and prosper. On our last night in the islands, everyone anchored in shallow water at high tide. Perhaps it was intentional as no one wanted to leave. And until the tides returned, no one could. Don't try this trick in your monohull or you'll find standing up a little difficult. But it does make life simple if your kids want to play on the beach. Just sail into a couple of feet of water and wait till the tide makes a beach under your boat. When the tide did return late in the morning, we left for the sail back to the mainland and our vans and trailers in the village of Bahia de Los Angeles. We traded tax with the rest of the fleet on the way home and were accompanied by another group of flotilla cruisers headed down the Sea of Cortez to the Pacific. <laughs> 